Hello, dear brethren. I am delighted to be part of this uh, education seminar and to be able to present this very important topic, uh, which is the importance of academic education. And on this topic, we are going to consider uh, both the importance and the impact that uh, a higher education had for people who were directly involved in the cause of God. And in order to do so, uh, we will examine this subject from both a historical and a biblical point. Now, we are going to consider several important topics. Actually, we are going to divide it into four or five topics while backing it up with paragraphs from the spirit of prophecy. And we are going to do that in order to consolidate the ideas and also to create a timeline between how the things were back in the days of uh, the people of Israel and how the things are or should be in our time. When we talk about knowledge or academic education, it is very important for us to consider both uh, the source and its limitations. Many times we ignore that um, these factors are extremely important so that the human being doesn't skip the condition of participating and understanding directly the will of God. We know that the source of all knowledge is God. And when we look at God as our source, uh, we feel our dependency towards Him. So it's very important that the student of the word and uh, the student of uh, any secular subject uh, understands and feels this dependence on God. Since uh, this was the posture of various men that fought and defended uh, the truth uh, throughout the history. Now, it is extremely important for us to be able to set certain limits between the human wisdom and the divine wisdom since this is our true safe net when it comes to protecting ourselves against uh, turning away from the one who is our true and only uh, source of knowledge. And talking about academic education, let us see what Sister White says in The Desire of Ages. And uh, it's written, We can trace the line of the world's great teachers as far back as human records extend. Every gem of thought, Every flash of intellect is from the light of the world. In these days, we hear much about higher education. The true higher education is that imparted by him in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So, analyzing this text, we come to the conclusion that there are certain limitations, certain limits for the human being, and there are none for God. So when the individual places himself uh, in an attitude of dependence towards God, then God can really use that individual in the advancement of his work, in the advancement of his ministry, uh, in attending uh, to the necessities of uh, his fellow beings and much more. On the other hand, if a person, regardless of how many studies, how many superior studies she may have, or uh, how much knowledge and wisdom he or she might have acquired, uh, if this individual doesn't recognize God as the source of all that knowledge, if he doesn't place it in the service of God and others, then we may literally say that uh, he or she is robbing God. Okay, now, as we open the Old Testament, uh, we see that in the time of the ancient Israel, many young boys and girls were, as if we could say in a modern way, homeschooled. So they received their first uh, educational studies at home. Why? Because at home, the children of Israel were exposed uh, to the real source of all wisdom and knowledge, which is God. And as the people of Israel grew and developed themselves into the great nation that they eventually became, uh, they continued practicing this educational system. Then as we get to the time of Samuel, we see a new institution being um, uh, opened or commencing, which is the schools of the prophets. Uh, and those schools and their educational system are all centered on the Bible. In other words, their foundation was the Word of God, whether uh, they were studying on human behavior or ethics, 
or any other studying topic, uh, their source of knowledge and wisdom was the Bible. And thus Israel was capacitating and preparing uh, their own children to one day become the light of the nations. However, when Israel would walk astray and they would start worshipping other idols, they would subsequently um, distance themselves from the source of all wisdom and knowledge, which is God. Then as we consider the history of the people of Israel, uh, we see quite a huge change when we get to the days of Jesus uh, and we realize that John the Baptist wasn't allowed to go to the schools of the rabbis or the schools of the prophets uh, because they were no longer centered upon the word of God. Uh, they lost their foundation. And thus John the Baptist uh, wasn't allowed to attend to these schools um, since we see that the oral law uh, became much, much greater uh, than the written law. So uh, thus, little by little, uh, the nation uh, of Israel uh, departed from the will of God. And these schools of the prophets uh, also departed from their original uh, purpose and project. Further on, we see that even Jesus himself didn't attend to any of these schools. And instead of that, uh, he was prepared and taught by his own mother, uh, who used the Word of God uh, as the material of his study. So we see that this, uh, um, which started as a, a biblical, uh, it went on to develop into the schools of the prophets. Uh, we, we see and we consider from the biblical history uh, that we which were basically chosen because of their mental capacities, because of their preparation, their skills, their wisdom, their knowledge. As we can see in Daniel chapter uh, 1, verse 3 uh, going forward, we can see that uh, the, the king Nebuchadnezzar uh, wanted to basically gather all the brilliant young minds uh, of the, the Babylon uh, Empire, from all the provinces, from all the captives, from all the regions possible, he wanted to gather uh, the brightest young minds uh, to his palace so that they might uh, undergo a specific training. And thus we can rightly assume that uh, all this preparation, all this knowledge, wisdom, skills uh, and, and mental capacities uh, that these three uh, young men together with Daniel uh, proved to have and to possess, uh, basically they received all that preparation uh, in the schools of the prophets. Now these four young Israelites were chosen by Nebuchadnezzar uh, and then they were placed on a, let's call it a program of study for three years before they were to be presented again to the king. On this subject, Sister White says uh, in the book Prophets and Kings, at the court of Babylon were gathered representatives from all lands, men of the highest talent, men the most richly endowed with natural gifts, and possessed of the broadest culture that the world could bestow. Yet among them all, the Hebrew youth were without a peer. In physical strength and beauty, in mental vigor and literary attainment, they stood unrivaled. But their learning did not come by chance. They obtained their knowledge by the faithful use of their powers. Under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, they placed themselves in connection with the source of all wisdom, making the knowledge of God the foundation of their education. So here we see the results of the education that these young men uh, received at home with the Bible being the main material of their preparation. And moving on from the Old Testament, uh, let's continue our journey, our study on uh, academic education in the New Testament. Will we find anything to back up uh, this topic in the New Testament? Let's see. Uh, apparently, we find a name or a man, a very capable and prepared man, who was, uh, if we may call it, immersed uh, in three worlds, three different worlds. The Hellenical world, the Roman world, and the Hebrew world. And this person is the Apostle Paul. He was born in Tarsus, the capital of Silica, and it seems that in Tarsus uh, there used to be this universitarian center where uh, Apostle Paul managed to get 
knowledge on Hellenism, Stoicism, and other philosophical areas. Further on, he moved to Jerusalem, where uh, he became the disciple or the apprentice of the great Gamaliel. And at his feet, he became a very capable man. Uh, we, could, we could say, we could definitely say that he became a doctor of the law. Then he became even part of the Sanhedrin. So basically, we could uh, say that Paul became a very important figure, a very capable figure. But then when uh, he had his encounter with Christ and when uh, God spoke with Ananias uh, concerning Paul, Ananias was rather sceptic about it. But then God said, I have chosen him so that he can uh, share the truth with the Gentiles. And then Ananias accepted uh, his mission, and uh, Paul thus became the great missionary uh, that we now know. The interesting point is that uh, since Apostle Paul was immersed into those uh, three worlds, the Roman, the Hebrew, and the Hellenistic, he could preach uh, to them, he could expose to them the, the truth, both in the synagogues, both before the Romans, uh, with power and knowledge. And he could do that successfully uh, because during his life he acquired knowledge, skills, preparation, uh, that further on capacitated him to speak before the high classes of the society and uh, any, any other class possible. Now, on a certain occasion, when Paul was in Athens, uh, he found himself surrounded uh, in a marketplace by uh, certain philosophers of the Epicureans and Stoics and other, uh, other very cold and very uh, highly educated men. And Sister White says in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, page 235, uh, she says the following, among those who encountered Paul in the marketplace were certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics, but they and all others who came in contact with him soon saw that he had a store of knowledge even greater than their own. His intellectual power commanded the respect of the learned, while his earnest logical reasoning and the power of his oratory held the attention of all in the audience. His hearers recognized the fact that he was no novice, but he was able to meet all classes with convicting arguments in support of the doctrines he taught. Thus the apostle stood undaunted, meeting his opposers on their own ground matching logic with logic, philosophy with philosophy, eloquence with eloquence. So you notice how important it is to uh, have people uh, possessing this superior education, um, people capacitated and prepared and trained and skilled, uh, and people with, with uh, a vast knowledge that can defend the truth and preach the truth with such a conviction uh, in such a complete form as Paul uh, here on this occasion did. Paul's influence on the New Testament was uh, truly impressive. And uh, we see that he had this influence because uh, he could preach not only to the Jews, he could preach to the Greeks, to the, to the Romans, uh, to the Gentiles of all sorts, and had the results uh, that followed. So, dear brethren, do we, do we notice, do we see how important it is for us to, to be a people capacitated with uh, as much knowledge as possible so that when we get into a situation in which we are going to uh, have to express, to, to preach, to defend the gospel, uh, that we may be able to do it as Paul did it, as Daniel and the three young friends of his did. Nevertheless, the crucial aspect of this point is that beyond all the secular education, beyond all the superior studies that we may be able to attain to and obtain, uh, we base our education, we base, uh, we, we put as the source of all uh, education or the source of all knowledge, God and His Word, as they did.
So we see that this educational system, which started as a homeschooling, a biblical homeschooling, and then went on uh, to develop into the schools of the prophets, with the passing of time, it seems that it lost uh, its purpose, it lost its center, its foundation, and was no longer based upon the Word of God. And thus, neither John the Baptist, neither Jesus was allowed to attend to any of these schools. Although it's worth considering and mentioning that these schools, up to the moment in which they maintained the focus, the center, the foundation uh, upon the Word of God, they were remarkably effective. And uh, we can say that based on the results uh, that uh, these schools produced. And one of these results were uh, Daniel and his three friends. And now, dear brethren, advancing from the period of the New Testament, several centuries down the road, we come to the Protestant movement. And when we talk about the Protestant movement, uh, we cannot but uh, remember, or probably the first name that comes into our minds, are the Valdenses. And during this rather turbulent period of the uh, Protestant Reformation or Protestant uh, movement, um, the ministry advanced because of these very dedicated and committed people. And I say dedicated because um, whether we talk about any secular work uh, that they would perform or uh, any academical study, they would do it at their very best. However, although they possessed a very uh, vast knowledge, vast academic or secular knowledge, their secret or the, the foundation of their knowledge was the Word of God, was the Bible. And this is the, the differentiation factor between them and the other people of that time. Uh, their intimate relationship with God, their communion with God. And above all, notwithstanding the fact that they were very knowledgeable and capacitated uh, people, they would give all the glory to God. And along the pages of history, we uh, come across many reformers, uh, many Valdenses or many other reformers that had to defend the truth before uh, the authorities. But one thing that uh, we usually see that they have in common is the fact that they were very prepared, uh, they were capacitated and they were studied uh, people. When we talk about reformers, uh, one of the names that comes into our minds is Wycliffe, uh, an Englishman, a very studied Englishman. Uh, he had superior academic education. Um, and when he came across um, and when he um, studied profoundly the word of God and he understood that the papacy wasn't really following uh, accordingly um, the, the, the word of God, he immediately uh, takes a stand and starts defending the truth as it is really uh, written in the Word of God. This stand, uh, this position of his got him in quite a bit of trouble because uh, he afterwards uh, went on being persecuted by the papacy. Now a bit on his background, we know about him that um, he had superior studies, uh, we know that he became an Oxford teacher, and uh, as soon as he got to know the truth, he defended uh, at any cost without even or without ever counting the consequences. When he passed away, uh, he was actually in his parochy uh, ministering, and he had um, a paralysis, but uh, throughout his whole life, uh, he uh, spent it defending the word of God. Afterwards came John Huss, who, although coming from a very humble and poor background, uh, was given by God the opportunity, the, uh, the privilege of studying at one of the most renowned universities at that time, which was the University of Prague where he could obtain a Torah education, academic education, in several subjects until uh, he as well was uh, exposed to the truth, uh, to the word of God, and he took the stand to um, preach this truth into the own language of the people. And as we know the history, after uh, several um, ecclesiastical meetings and trials, 
uh, and persecution, he finally was condemned to death. By his side uh, stood a guy called Geronimo, who also had superior studies uh, in France, and then uh, he also had a master degree, and he, together with uh, Haas, they were two men, two educated men that stood against the papacy at a time in which uh, the humble people uh, wouldn't be able to uh, either defend the truth or know the truth in their own language. And like them, there were many other reformers that uh, took a stand for the truth. But one name that really stands out is the name of Luther, who was also a very uh, knowledgeable uh, man. He uh, had studies, uh, he uh, was graduated uh, in law, uh, and then he passed on uh, to, into te theology and uh, he got his master's. Uh, but then at some specific point, he came across the Bible and he discovered the truth in a way in which uh, it wasn't pre presented by the, uh, by the papacy. As we know, he became one of the greatest defenders of the truth, uh, facing the papacy and their errors in front of the ecclesiastical meetings, uh, through his theses and all that while facing tremendous persecution. Luther was a truly great reformer. And as we can see through the history of God's church, uh, we see over and over again God raising people who are capacitated, prepared, educated, and willing to combat, to, to fight for the truth, to defend the truth while giving God all the glory. And um, we see Sister White talking about it in uh, the book Education, in chapter 30, at page 245. And she says, such examples are not found in the Bible only. They abound in every record of human progress. The Vaudois and the Huguenots, Wycliffe and Huss, Jerome and Luther, Tyndale and Knox, Zinderdorf and Wesley, with multitudes of others, have witnessed to the power of God's word against human power and policy in support of evil. These are the world's true nobility. This is its royal line. It is in this line, the youth of today are called to take their places. Notice what it says here, that these are the world's true nobility. This is its royal line. Why? Because these educated and highly capacitated and prepared people, uh, despite all their knowledge and, uh, and capacity and higher education, they were willing to place it all at God's feet and through the influence of the Holy Spirit, they were used to bring to the, to the simple ones uh, the truth in a way in which they were not able to get it from themselves or to, to study it for themselves. Dear brethren, as we just studied, we noticed that this topic of higher or academic education travels through quite an extended timeline, uh, considering from the time of the people of Israel to the time of Daniel and the three young men. Then uh, moving on to the New Testament, we see uh, it in the time of uh, Apostle Paul, and then all the way to the to the reform, uh, to the Protestant reform, and their great movement that was preaching Christ with power. And thus we come all the way to our time. And what do you brethren think? Do we need, uh, nowadays, in the present age, do we need people that are prepared, that are studied, that are qualified? What do you think? Let's see what uh, Sister White says. You see, brethren, uh, I heard it on and on uh, being talked about, being preached about, that the university is the gate of hell. And it's right. If you think about it in uh, the book Great Controversy, uh, we, we read about the time in which the clerks would uh, really teach uh, very wrong, very uh, erroneous things. And it came to a point in which parents would decide not to uh, allow their children to study at these universities anymore. And that was completely right. However, Luther, uh, talking about the problem uh, of the university being the gate of hell, he states that the real problem here is when these institutions uh, remove the word of God as the foundation of their studies.
This is what he's talking about in this text. Um, that's why the Church of God today, in the present age, needs also people who are prepared with, uh, with an academic education, uh, superior studies, uh, and people that would put as the foundation, as the basement of all their studies, the Word of God. And now moving on to our present time, let us consider and reflect upon what Sister White uh, writes on this topic of uh, superior studies and academic uh, education. Thus far, we saw a lot on how God used uh, various capacitated and prepared men throughout history uh, to uh, defend the truth, to um, fight for the truth. But we believe that in our days, we also need prepared men, uh, people that are capacitated to preach the gospel in both a rural and an urban area, uh, to preach the gospel to both the poor and the higher classes of the societies and be able to argument and have, uh, have strong arguments, wise, rational, um, and knowledgeable arguments on the defense of truth. We need people as such prepared uh, to defend and to respond to heresies and erroneous teachings that the world itself will try uh, with the passing of time to bring inside our church. Now, talking on this subject, uh, Sister White writes uh, in the book Testimony Treasures, Volume 2, page uh, 228. It's quite a, a big paragraph. That's why we decided to split it into uh, three parts. And we read, it says, It is not wise to be constantly expending means to open untried fields while so little is done to prepare workers to occupy them. Then it goes on saying, we would that there were strong young men, rooted and grounded in the faith, who had such a living connection with God, that they could, if so counseled by our leading brethren, enter the higher colleges in our land, where they would have a wider field for study and observation. Association with different classes of minds and acquaintance with the workings and results of popular methods of education and a knowledge of theology as taught in the leading institutions of learning would be of great value to such workers, preparing them to labor for the educated classes and to meet the prevailing errors of our time. Such was the method pursued by the ancient Valdenses, and, if true to God, our youth, like theirs, might do a work, a good work, even while gaining their education in sowing the seeds of truth in other minds. And finally, it says, we see the need of encouraging higher ideas of education and of employing more trained men in the ministry. Now, uh, considering this text, we can analyze uh, several points, and the first of which is that many times we open new fields without possessing or without having a prepared um, or capacitated workers to uh, be placed in these new fields. We see it happening quite often uh, in our days that a, a young new worker is being placed into an urban field um, and he starts preaching, but unfortunately he doesn't know how to go in, he doesn't know how to uh, come out, he doesn't know how to uh, have an eloquent speech, how to speak with eloquence, uh, he doesn't know how to speak with uh, higher classes of society uh, because simply he wasn't prepared, uh, he uh, doesn't have the right studies for the, um, the position that he's holding and in where he is being placed. So what basically Sister White is trying to tell us here is that we cannot be um, unwise in uh, placing young, unexperienced um, workers that are not particularly prepared or not, that do not have uh, specific studies for performing in that particular environment. And she also goes on to say that we should inspire and influence our youth to pursue uh, superior studies. Here in particular, she mentions about the theology schools and universities where our youth can uh, study that which is useful while also being an influence and uh, being a light for their colleagues, teachers, and so on.
It's written as well that people uh, that, pos uh, that, that, uh, that occupy higher class in the society need others that uh, are prepared and studied and capacitated uh, to come and present them the truth, just like Daniel, uh, Apostle Paul and Luther did it. Thus, we see here uh, quite a broad context that presents the academic education as both important and impacting. Since God can use men and women possessing such an education to reach to certain classes of people uh, to whom uh, a less educated or uh, a less prepared person would find it close to impossible to reach to. And now we are left with a question, is it or is it not important for us to have men and women prepared with a, a higher academical uh, education on our side, on, uh, in our churches? And the answer is a definite and strong yes. Now God calls and continues calling until today people like Daniel, like Apostle Paul, like John Haas, like Luther, uh, who would prepare themselves with higher studies, academical studies, and would be thus capacitated to preach the gospel, to present the truth under circumstances in which uh, other people couldn't. There are people and uh, places that find themselves under preconcept and prejudice. Um, and to these kind of people, if there would be a certain person with a lower education would come to try and, and, and make contact and talk to, probably the doors would be closed. While if someone else with a higher education uh, would come, uh, the doors would be open. And now for conclusion, I would like to consider with you one last text. It was God who qualified the young Hebrews to be ten times wiser than the other students of that time. It was God who led Paul to live in one of the main university centers of his day. It was by his providence that Haas, coming from a poor family, received, received free admission to the University of Prague. It was not chance that led these and other spirit-imbued servants to advocate the truth before kings, princes, and courts. Such a scenario aims a lesson for these and, who knows, future generations. God never ignored and never disregarded the importance of higher education. If, in some cases, it served as a stumbling block to the cause of God, the problem was never at the source, which is God, but rather in the disrespectful attitude that some have undertaken to exceed their limits. And now, dear brethren, uh, as a review, do we understand that God used man with a higher education and how important this was in the work that the ministry had to perform. We see the importance of the school of the prophets, uh, even at a time when the people of Israel were uh, led captives into Babylon, we, uh, we find uh, written about Daniel and his three friends that at some point they were students of uh, one of these schools. And when they were led captives into Babylon, these uh, four young men, they were found 10 times wiser than any other people that were uh, under those circumstances brought uh, before for Nebuchadnezzar. Or when we think about Apostle Paul and the influence or the impact that he had in the Mediterranean uh, region, uh, the fact that he was capacitated and he had superior studies and he was able to speak with more eloquence and, and uh, connect his uh, thinking or his speaking with a rational uh, way of argumenting. How, inf how important or how impacting this uh, was on opening doors uh, to the gospel throughout all that Mediterranean, Mediterranean region. Lastly, how can we forget about Luther and how handy, how useful came all that superior education that he possessed? Uh, how useful was that in the work of God and how God could use him uh, to perform such a great, great reformation uh, in the time of the Protestant uh, movement? Dear brethren, God is calling us as a church to reflect and to consider upon our position uh, as a people as far as the academic education is concerned. 
This new modern world, with all its theories and philosophies, trying even to change moral or ethical conducts, must be confronted. We need to be able to debate on favor of the truth. But for that, we need a specific education. May God help us, just like Daniel, Apostle Paul, Luther, to continuously seek knowledge. But above all else, let us never forget the fountain, the source of all knowledge, which is found in Christ. Amen.